Well, welcome to Friday, and this is a little unusual. Um, I'm going to be reading to you from a book I dearly love, Around the World with Auntie Mame, and it's by Patrick Dennis. Now, this happens to be my own personal copy, but you know, I was telling you uh, and we've had some programs about x-ray reading and being visually aware and pulling things apart, putting them back together again. I want you to notice HB, that's their uh, icon for uh, Harcourt Brace and Company. I mentioned it for a reason. Look at this. Now, I have long since lost the cover of this, but Shepherds, Cairo, Ritz, Paris, Claridge's, London, uh, the Soccer uh, Hotel. It, those are the, the emblems that all of these places had, hotels uh, that you would stick in your luggage to say, oh, I've been to the Ritz in Paris. Where have you been? Julie? Okay. I pointed it out for a reason. There's a wonderful artist, uh, Dick Dodge, whose work is seen in quite a few uh, books of in the 50s, late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Notice, this is the only artwork in this particular book. But you really, if you look at that, you kind of know what it's about. There is classy luggage. Uh, that one is probably Louis Vuitton with the shelves, uh, the drawers coming out. But there's there's sh women's shoes. There is a cigarette in a holder. There are two martini glasses. There's a, a, a jewelry case with uh, pearls spilling out and all sorts of goodies. But then, you know what I asked you to look at? There is HB which is not the symbol of a hotel, but is Harcourt Brace and Company, New York, the publishing firm. They got a little free advertising in there. The closer you look at these things, the more uh, wonderful surprises you can get along the way. Now, Patrick Dennis dedicated this to the one and only Rosalind Russell. Now, many of you will be aware there was a movie, Mame, starring Rosalind Russell. There is this book. There was a play on Broadway, which I went to many, many times, starring Angela Lansbury. And it was really quite wonderful. B. Arthur was in it. There was also a movie musical, um, which I won't comment on. Lucille Ball was in it, but B. Arthur was too. She played Vera. And what I chose to read to you today is really just the opening sequence. And you're welcome to, uh, to get this book and, and read further stories because they are incredible. And when, just before I get to the end, I'll tell you about some of the places Auntie Mame went. But now, to begin, Auntie Mame and Posterity. Christmas is nearly here, and I look forward to it more and more with loathing. All the shops that didn't have their holiday decorations up by Michael Mass made for it uh, up by, by sheer ostentation by Halloween canned carols bleat from every corner. The clerks at Saks are surlier. The ones at Lord and Taylor, lordlier. The ones at Bergdorf's, bitchier than at any season. All about me. <clears throat> I see children being led by the hand to wheedle toy department Santa Clauses out of the most ruinous remembrances. On the commuter's train, each night, I see fathers burdened with bulky packages discussing, oh, not taxes, not politics, not the market. 
but the complexities of assembling electric trains and uh, English bicycles. I hate to go to my office each day because all that awaits me is nothing. A message from that pompous young ass in the State Department saying that no reliable information has been uncovered as yet, but every effort is being made. A cable from the Countess of Upshot, the former Vera Charles, saying that she just missed making contact at the Aga Khan's funeral in July, but thought she saw them at the Copenhagen airport in uh, September. A rambling letter from my London operative, Percy Peekaboo Pankhurst, announcing that his detective agency is still hot on the trail and asking for yet another hundred pounds, even more. <laughs> I hate to go home at night Home is a Georgian-type house in uh, Verdon Greens, a community of 200 houses in four styles just over an hour from New York, if the train is on time. My wife and I hate the house. We also hate Verdon Greens, but we only moved there when our son was born so that he would have grass beneath his feet, fresh air, and rather mediocre schooling under the collective gimlet eye of a meddlesome group of verdant greens mothers who have a smattering of psychiatric jargon. And now my wife and I have come to hate even each other. Our overpriced, ill-built little house, seven rooms, two and a half baths, expansion attic, has become an empty echoing shell, the prison of two lonely, silent, frustrated people. The son, uh, for whose well-being the house was bought, is no longer here. He was kidnapped in 1954. Oh, now when I say kidnapped, no, 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 no. I don't mean to imply anything like uh, you know, ransom notes and a ladder against the wall. He went away just after his seventh birthday with our kisses and our blessing. We even waved him off at Idlewild as a big Pan American airplane carried him off to India. But we have never seen him or rarely heard of him since. That was June of 1954. He was supposed to be back by Labor Day in time for school. Two and a half years have passed, and now we face another melancholy Christmas without Michael in the house. And all because Auntie May fancied the child and wanted to take him on a little outing. <laughs> You know, my Auntie Mae is a most unusual woman. She raised me from the time I was orphaned at 10. Oh, not because anyone wanted her to, oh, look far from it, or because she herself had any desire to take on a, a lonely only child during her heyday in 1929. It was simply that she was my only living relative. We were stuck with each other and we had to make the best of it. But raise me she did in her own helter-skelter fashion to the horror of my trustee, Mr. Dwight Babcock of the Nicobacca Trust Company, to the horror of the masters at St. Boniface Academy in Apathy, Massachusetts where Mr. Babcock finally put me after uh, Auntie Mame's forays into um, 
progressive education, and sometimes even to the horror of me. We lived in many places together, Auntie Mame and I. We lived in a duplex in Beekman Place during the 20s when Auntie Mame was still Miss Dennis, still rich and still in her Japanese days. Well, we lived in a carriage house in Murray Hill during the Depression before Auntie Mame found love and marriage and even more riches as Mrs. Beauregard Jackson Pickett Burnside. You know, for a while, we lived on a plantation in Georgia with, with Uncle Bo. Then when Auntie Mame became the ninth richest widow in New York, we lived in a big townhouse in Washington Square. And we also lived in various other places around the world until I grew up and got married. And after that, Auntie Mame's address, whenever she stayed still long enough to have one, was the St. Regis Hotel. Today, I don't know where Auntie Mame is living. I wish I did, because that's where my son, Michael, is living too. Well, assuming, of course, that the boy is still alive. But as unorthodox and eccentric, I will heard detractors have even used such adjectives as um, depraved and uh, lunatic, as Auntie Mame's methods of childcare may have been, I don't think that any of the unusual things she did ever hurt me. This, however, is not quite the opinion of my wife, Peggy. When I got home to Verdant Greens last night, Peggy was waiting at the door. <laughs> Chilly out, dear, I said, kissing her. Anything in the mail? I mean, like, you know, especially terrible Christmas cards. Begin knew perfectly well what I meant and went on to say so. I know perfectly well what you mean. You mean, is there some word from our child or from that mad woman who carried him off? And the answer is no. Just as it's been every day for the last four months. No, no, no. My God, Patrick. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't even think, worrying about my baby in the, the hands of that old maniac. For all we know, poor little Michael may be dead and buried. Oh, no, I scarcely think so. We, we'd have heard, surely. Heard? What have we heard? Six cables, a few miserable scribbled postcards. Oh, you know, the Taj Mahal, a bathhouse in Tokyo. Oh, a lamasery in Tibet, an apartment house in Tel Aviv that looked like a dresser with all the drawers open. Huh. Oh, the Istanbul Hilton, the Mozart Festival, Animation sur la plage from Cap d'Antibes. Those and about a dozen more and not one word about our child in two and a half years. Oh, you know, now that's not quite true, Pekin. Both Michael and Auntie Mame have been very good about remembering our birthdays, our, our anniversary, Christmas. Oh, and very handsomely, too. I still wear that Mandarin. Christmas! How can you say that word? This will be our third Christmas without a child in the house. Don't you think everyone in Verdant Greens is talking? Well, I'm certainly talking, but it's rarely interesting enough to 
That boy's almost 10 years old. I haven't seen him since he was seven. He'll never be a Cub Scout, and I'll never be a den mother. Uh, not if I have anything to say about it. You won't. Well, you know, I grant you that sounds dismal. But think of the other things our baby is missing. Proper schooling, the, the companionship of children his own age, sports, Sunday school, Christmas, nonsense, I said trying to be as bland and offhand as possible because I was just as worried about Auntie Mame and Michael as Piggy. Only I didn't want her to know that. As Auntie Mame always said, I could learn more in 10 minutes in her drawing room than I could in 10 years at school. But, oh, you know, she was right, too. I saw more of children my own age than I wanted to. As for Christmas, she gave me some damn nice things. Such as what? All I could remember offhand was a list of items that would hardly have comforted a worried mother. Let's see, uh, a live alligator a samurai sword, a, a chimpanzee that promptly died. Oh, and a lifetime course at Arthur Murray's. Oh, nothing, just some very nice things. But don't you realize that she's simply stolen our child away from us? If he were to march into this room right now, he wouldn't recognize his own parents. Oh, ho, ho, ho. look, I know her game. I'm a woman, too. She plans to take over our child entirely, to twist him around her finger to teach him life on her terms, as uh, life as uh, Mame Dennis Burnside sees it so that he'll end up just as scatterbrained and eccentric as she is. If you please, I said. She raised me from the time of, uh, I was 10 until I escaped, uh, that, that it is uh, until I, I met you. Do you find me so odd? Don't I imagine to shower every day, hold down a decent job with a reputable firm? Do I keep a, a collection of boots and whips in the cellar? Don't I pay my taxes, come home every night on the 603? Sometimes I even wish I were a little more colorful, a little less dull. So do I. But that is beside the point. The point is that your aunt took our child away two and a half years ago. She promised that he'd be home by Labor Day, and here it is, 1957, and now, do be fair, Piggy, Auntie Mame did not say which Labor Day. Don't interrupt. Bit by bit, she's taken over. First a cable begging to let him stay until Christmas. I never should have consented, but I did. And then a long letter telling me, oh, how good he was at skiing and how wonderful the snow was at Chamonix and what an aptitude Michael had for French. It was the French that did it. She knew what a pushover I was for Racine. I've always found him rather tiresome. The next thing uh, we heard Lady Bountiful had our little boy in an aqualung down with sharks and barracuda and I don't know what. Well, you were complaining about him having no sports and that wonderful opportunity to get him into the Forbidden City, play with the Dalai Lama. 
Oh, next, next, it was a, a papal audience. Then the uh, Red Dean of... And you will complain about religion. I'm complaining about everything. It was bad enough when we knew where they were. But for the last four months, there hasn't been one word, not a letter, not a cable, not a, so much as a line scrawled on a postcard. That mad aunt of yours probably got that innocent child smoking, drinking, taking dope. Now, don't be ridiculous. He was sneaking cigarettes by the time he was six. You've always let him sniff away at that stuff you use to remove nail enamel. <clears throat> and that old father of yours had him swilling beer in his bassinet. And he may, may be unorthodox, but she's not unreliable. I'm not in the least concerned I lie. You see, she's reared you to be an unnatural father. Well, I'm plenty worried, sick with worry. He's too young and she's too old. Oh, she'd scratch your eyes out if you heard you say it. Besides, she makes a most colorful traveling companion. Oh, I can attest to that. She took me around the world and where am I now? Verdant greens. Gaining weight, losing hair, married, settled, and middle-aged. When did she take you around the world? Oh, no. It was a long time ago, you know, before the war. Why didn't you ever tell me? Didn't I? Well, if I didn't, it was probably because there wasn't much to tell. Oh, you know, Peggy, just, just that, that tourist stuff. Well, we have all night. You can start telling me now. Just when was this grand tour? Oh, no, it was, a, it was a long time back. 10, 15, 20 years ago. It, it, it was in 1937, right after I was kicked out. Right after I finished at St. Boniface Academy. Before I went to college, how long were you gone? Pegine asked. Well, it was for an indefinite stay. Almost all of Auntie Mame's visits are indefinite, and she's rarely any place on time. Now, you know, that might account for uh, Michael's being so late in getting home. Two and a half years? Oh, you know, why don't we have a drink, dear? Sit right there and start talking. I can hear you while I mix them. Now, commence. Well, you know, there's nothing to tell, really. Michael went to India and I uh, started, and we started from there. You know, we went the other way. What other way? Well, we set out in May of 1937 on the old Normandy. Oh, what a ship that was. I've seen it, Pegeen said, handing me a drink. Go on. Well, we weren't going to take Ito. Do you mean that inane, giggling Japanese houseman of hers? Ito has always been a very good friend, I said, with dignity, both to Auntie Mame and to me. 
Well, you know, he did join us later, but we, we set off alone. In the Deauville suite of the Normandy, oh, the captain's table, and all the pomp and circumstance in the world. Well, you know, that's about it. Go on, Pegine said in an I mean business tone of voice. Well, if memory serves, the Normandy used to land in France. And so, well, and so, you know, we went to Paris. Next chapter, which I'm going to read just the beginning of, and it's titled, anti main the City of Light. Oh, you're being ridiculous to worry this way, I told Pegine, trying hard to conceal the concern I felt. How could the boy get into any troubles traveling around the world with his great aunt? An elderly woman, actually, and hardly likely to debauch a ten-year-old child. She certainly tried hard enough with you, Pegine said. Why, that is outrageous. I, I, I sputtered. She did no such thing. Now take Paris, for example. What do most people bring back from Paris? A social disease. Oh, certainly not. They bring back memories. The Eiffel Tower, the, the Louvre, Versailles. You know, things like that. And what did you do when she took you to Paris? Well, why nothing much. I mean, we, we went to the usual places. Notre Dame, the Bon Marché, Maxims. We did all the museums and galleries and churches and... And? Oh, yes, what, once we even attended the French National Theater. So? So that was all. That wasn't all. But I'd rather be hung by my th thumbs than tell poor Pekin about Auntie Maine in Paris. No! <laughs> Patrick, my little love, Auntie Mame said, squeezing my hand. Don't you feel the magic of Paris? Paris, mon coeur, la vieille lumière. The taxi cab swung off the rue Saint-Honoré with a suddenness that threw Auntie Mame to the floor. Merde, she said. Well, I said, yes, I did feel the magic of Paris, and didn't Annie Mame think she'd feel a whole lot better if she just sat back and relaxed until we got to the hotel? She was still uh, adjusting her rakish off-the-face hat as the taxi, somewhat more sedately, circled the Place Vendôme and pulled up at the Ritz. Paris was to Auntie Mame more a Macy's than a metropolis, and the Ritz was within spitting distance of Chaparelli and Chanel and Elizabeth Arden, Ooh, and Cartier, and most of the other departments that Auntie Mame liked to patronize. And she was enchanted to see the huge bouquet from César Ritz himself waiting in her sitting room. No, dear old Monsieur Ritz, she said wistfully, he never forgets me. You do, I said, casing the Louis XVI splendor of the suite. Auntie Mae drew off her gloves, overtipped the men with the luggage, and gazed dreamily out the window in the general direction of Chaparellas. Well, it does go on here, from sidecars to Auntie Vera appearing, and quite a few other 
adventures, including one involving Russian wolfhounds, a trip to the lap of Mr. Babcock, a trip to a jail. Uh, you're going to have to read this book because even the movie, even the musical doesn't tell all the stories of what happened in Europe with Patrick and Auntie May. Till Wednesday, poetry, you have a wonderful weekend.